Hi there, and welcome to The Daily Gardener, and thank you for listening. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling. It's February 23rd, and there are just 25 days until the first day of spring. Today, we celebrate a woman known as the Lady of Botany. Yet today, few people know her life story, and fewer still appreciate her difficult professional journey. We'll also learn about another female botanist who started one of the first degree botany programs for women in England. And we'll hear a story about a mink who set up residence in a winter garden of an avid gardener and writer. It's a very cute little story. And we grow that garden library today with a delightful book about cottage gardening. What could be more charming? And then we wrap things up with the story of a dried flower expert who created Everlastings for Celebrities. And he also shares some of his favorite flowers to preserve for long-term joy and delight. But first, let's kick things off with an article, today's curated news. It's from the Royal Botanic Garden, Edinburgh, and it was written by Leonie Patterson. And her post was about Sir Isaac Bailey Belfour. Now, anything by Leone generally catches my eye because she works at the Royal Botanic Garden and she does such a wonderful job in helping to preserve and keep alive all these wonderful stories of the people that were true pioneers in botany. Now, this particular article on Sir Isaac Bailey Belfour is actually an extended version of a talk that Leone gave. It was called Trailblazers, and it marked the garden's 350th anniversary back in October of 2020. That was on the 15th of October was the official 350th anniversary. Isaac followed in his father's footsteps when he became a gardener. And in fact, he eventually became the Regis Keeper of the Garden of the Royal Botanic Garden in 1888. Now, when I think of Isaac Belfour, I think of his strong desire to educate his students to become top horticulturists and foresters. And in this post, there is a marvelous picture of Sir Isaac sitting down. He's in the front row and he's surrounded by his students. It's just an incredible picture. And it looks like they're in one of the greenhouses. It's really a treasure. And then the other thing that I love about how Leone writes her historical posts is that she always includes these lovely little anecdotes. In this piece, she writes... In the years before the First World War, it was the custom for the professor of botany to take his class out for a botanical excursion on Saturday mornings. Well, one day, Isaac was standing beside a hillside pond, and he was teaching the students about a particular elga. You can almost guess what happened next. The class was crowding around him when one of the students, it says, with more brawn than brains, decided to give a shove and Belfour lost his balance and was pushed into the water. Now, Leone goes on to say that the moral of the story was that that particular student never passed his professional exams. And sadly, what that student ended up doing was joining the army and then in the outbreak of the war was killed in France. And Leone speculates that Isaac Belfour went on to name a plant after this student. And she speculates that the student was David Hume. Well, I could go on and on about all of the wonderful little details in this presentation that Leone shared in this post. But of course, we don't have time. So if you would like to read Leone's post for yourself in the Facebook group for the show, all you need to do when you're in the Daily Gardener community is search for the word Isaac, I-S-A-A-C, and Leone's post will pop right up. And if you're not in the Facebook group, 
Don't worry, it is so easy to join. All you need to do the next time you're on Facebook is search for Daily Gardener Community, where you'd search for a friend and then request to join. I'd love to meet you in the group. Here's today's botanical history for February 23rd. Today is the birthday of the British plant morphologist and anatomist, botanical historian, and philosopher of biology, Agnes Arbor, who was born on this day, February 23rd, in 1879. Since her father was the artist Henry Robertson, Agnes learned to draw as a child, and throughout her life, Agnes illustrated all of her own botanical work. Agnes's mom was also an Agnes, and she fostered her daughter's love of plants. Mentored and befriended by the botanist Ethel Sargent, Agnes mastered the microscope. Ethel was a profound role model in Agnes's life. She not only taught Agnes her earliest lessons in botany, but she also modeled a unique approach to her work because Agnes watched Ethel successfully conduct work in a small laboratory she had built in her home. Later, when Agnes wrote her first book on her dear monocots, which are grass or grass-like flowering plants, she dedicated her work to the woman who was the godmother to her only child, Muriel Agnes Arbor, and the brightest beacon in her botanical career, Ethel Sargent. In 1909, Agnes married a paleobotanist, Edward Alexander Newell Arbor of Trinity College at Cambridge, and it was thanks in part to Edward that Agnes moved to Cambridge from London and made a life there. Edward promised Agnes that, quote, life in Cambridge offered unique opportunities for the observation of river and Finland plants. Despite Edward's appeal, for Agnes, Cambridge was tough. It was a much harder place for a female botanist than London, where Agnes would have had more opportunities, more connection, and acceptance. Sadly, Agnes and Edward would be married for only nine years, as Edward died in 1918. And so, before her 40th birthday, Agnes found herself both a widow and a single mother to six-year-old Muriel. After securing help with child care and household duties, Agnes carried on with her botanical work. She wrote constantly. She was poorly compensated for her work, and she never remarried. A few years after Agnes arrived in Cambridge, she'd started working at the Belfort Laboratory, which was owned by Newnham College, and was a place for teaching women. Now, the creation of this laboratory was a direct result of allowing women admittance into Cambridge. And although women could attend Cambridge, they could not go to labs or classes. And so the Belfort Lab became their only option for conducting experiments. Over the 19 years that Agnes worked at Belfort, the female students gradually disappeared as classes and lab opportunities opened up for them in botany, chemistry, geography, etc. By 1925, Newnham College was ready to sell the lab to Cambridge. They needed the cash, and it seems only Agnes needed the lab. Yet, When Agnes reached out to Cambridge, both the university and the head of botany, Albert Seward, rejected her, suggesting that she might seek out a space to work at the Botanic Garden. And so, an accomplished botanist and the widow of a Cambridge professor, no less, was left with nowhere to work. Seven years after her husband's death, Agnes, like her mentor and friend Ethel Sargent, set up a home laboratory 
in the back of her house over the kitchen. Agnes worked from home for the rest of her life. A lover of researching whatever captured her curiosity, Agnes allowed her intellect to veer into areas seldom explored by her botanist peers, such as history, philosophy, poetry, and art. Yet each of these disciplines molded and refined Agnes's perspective on plant morphology, and they put her in a unique position to write her most impactful philosophical works in the twilight of her life. When it came time for Agnes to publish her final work, Cambridge snubbed her again when they declined to publish it. So, as per usual, Agnes persevered without the university's help. Agnes became interested in botanical history after reading the old herbals. In 1912, Agnes released a book called Herbals, Their Origin and Evolution. And her work reviewed the primary herbals that had been written for the 200-year time period between 1470 and 1670. These beautiful books formed the basis of botanical education for centuries. And luckily for Agnes, many were housed at Cambridge. In her book, Agnes examines how the plant descriptions and illustrations evolved over time. Her work was an instant classic, and Agnes forever changed the way herbals were reviewed and written. Now, in her philosophical work, The Mind and the Eye, Agnes argued that there was a blurred line between the science and art of botany. Botanists cannot fully capture a flower through data alone, just as the painter cannot paint all that a flower contributes to nature. And any gardener who sees their garden with their head and their heart can relate to Agnes's philosophy. When she was 67 years old, Agnes Arbor became the first female botanist to be elected as a Royal Society Fellow. Two years later, she became the first woman to receive the Linnaean Society's gold medal for her botanical work. Known by many in her circle as the Lady of Botany, Agnes wrote, A record of research should not resemble a casual pile of quarried stone. It should seem, quote, not built, but born, as Vasari said, in praise of a building. Today, you can toast Agnes with a gin made in the UK. It's made in Agnes's honor. It's called Agnes Arbor Gin, and it's made with nine botanicals, including angelica, cassia, coriander, grapefruit, iris, juniper, lemon, licorice, and orange. And I think Agnes would be especially touched by the beautiful hand-drawn botanical illustrations on the label of every bottle. And if ever there was a female botanist that deserved to be toasted, I believe Agnes Arbor fits the bill. And today is the anniversary of the death of the British botanist and botanical pioneer, Marion Delph Smith, who died on this day, February 23rd in 1980. A botanical trailblazer, Marion started the botany program at London's Westfield, a woman's college preparatory school, in 1906. To make the program a reality, Marion fundraised relentlessly, and then she bought everything the program needed to teach botany, mount specimens, store collections, and conduct field work. Ultimately, Westfield became one of the only places in the world where women could learn how to study botany. And in 1915, almost a decade after starting her degree program, Marion was finally able to award bachelor degrees in botany 
to her students. 67 years after starting her botany program, Marion was honored by her students on the occasion of her 90th birthday. Marion died seven years later on this day in 1980. She was 97 years old. And there's a lovely side note about Marion's botanical career. At one point, Marion served as an editor for a botanical comedy magazine called The Sportifite. In the magazine, Marion once shared a poem she'd written called A Botanical Dream. And so in order to help you understand it, I thought I would quickly share some definitions so that you can appreciate her verse. Gymnosperms produce seed cones like conifers and the ginkgo. The medullosa and pteridosperms are extinct plants in the seed fern group. Calamites are extinct swamp plants. They're related to horsetails, except that they can grow as tall as a 10-story building. Cryptograms are plants that reproduce by spores, not flowers or seeds. Sphenophyllum cones refers to a spore-filled cone of an extinct group of plants that are a sister group to modern horsetails. And Paleozoic is a reference to a long-ago era. The end of the Paleozoic period marked the most extraordinary extinction event on the Earth. And now, without further ado, here's Marion's brief poem called A Botanical Dream. Last night as I lay dreaming, there came a dream so fair I stood mid ancient gymnosperms beneath the ginkgo rare. I saw the medullosa with multipartite fronds and watched the sunset rosy through calamites' wands. O oh, cryptograms, pteridosperms, and sphenophyllum cones, why did ye ever fossilize to Paleozoic stones? A little botanical humor for you. In Unearthed Words, today's words are from a new book called Time and the Garden. It's a delightful little book written by Joe Busha. And this is an excerpt from her section on February. The most predacious winter visitor we have had was a mink that took up residence under the woodpile one winter. The end of the pile was only 20 feet or so from the place where the drain pipe stuck out of the pond, which tends to be open even when other areas of the pond are frozen. The mink had found the perfect carryout restaurant right across from his winter abode. We timed him. 20 seconds from leaving the woodpile to returning with a crawfish. We never saw him return empty-handed. I bet not. It's time to grow that garden library with today's book, English Cottage Gardening by Margaret Hensel. This book came out in 2000, and the subtitle is For American Gardeners, Revised Edition. In this book, Margaret shares everything she knows about English cottage gardening, and she's as charming as her topic. Margaret breaks down 10 cottage gardens owned by everyday gardeners in England and America. By deliberately not focusing on estate gardens, Margaret shows daily gardeners how anyone can cultivate the charm of a cottage garden. With inspiring photographs, Margaret focuses on plants that are easy to grow and give the look cottage gardeners love. Enchanted shapes and natural forms, gentle colors, and endearing varieties. The last section of the book shares a glossary of 76 plant recommendations, including the Latin and common names, how to use them in the garden, as well as a list of places to find old rose varieties. This book is 
256 pages of an English cottage garden masterclass taught by a garden designer who loves to teach the most novice gardener to create enchanting gardens and vistas right outside their windows. You can get a copy of English Cottage Gardening by Margaret Hensel and support the show using the Amazon link in today's show notes for around $10. Such a steal. Finally, here's something sweet to revive the little botanic spark in your heart. It was on this day, February 23rd in 1991, that the Hartford Current shared an article that was written by Anne Farrow called Garden of Everlasting Delights. This fantastic article features Greg Fisk of Greg Fisk Designs and his incredible dried arrangements and flower drying skills. Greg's creations are truly a cut above the rest, and his celebrity clients have included Barbara Streisand and Lady Bird Johnson. And a photo of one of his swags highlights outstanding features like small flower pots, hydrangea, globe amaranth, one of my favorites, and love in a mist. Now, as for Greg's favorite plants to grow for drying, here's what Greg suggests. Some of the basics are globe amaranth, which signifies immortality, American statusy, which is a ruffle-edged annual that's durable and can be grown in a variety of colors, as well as straw flowers, asters, zinnias, heather in several different colors, and nigella a flower with delicate mauve seed heads and a beautiful common name, Love in a Mist. The current crop of books on growing flowers for drying also recommends hosta, the ubiquitous shade garden perennial, poppies, which have a globe-shaped seed case that dries easily, a stilby, ivy, baby's breath, and the evocatively named money plant, which has a silvery translucent seed case. Great idea. Now, another must-have for the home gardener who's interested in drying flowers is the rose. And here, Greg recommends planting a climbing rose, like the one called the fairy. It adds a finished, old-fashioned appearance to dried arrangements. And as someone who used to grow the fairy, I can tell you that that would exactly be the case. It would be a great addition. Now, from the herb family, Greg chooses rosemary, which of course has dark blue-green needles and a wonderfully piney perfume. He also likes bay for its fragrance, and both silver king and silver queen artemisia. The artemisias, which are really silver-colored, look very handsome and puffy in the garden and in dried arrangements. The bright golden florets of yarrow, a perennial grown in the earliest New World gardens, is another of the herbs that Greg always chooses, as are lamb's ears, which has a velvety gray-green leaf that's soft even when it's dried. And it's often shown in herb kits for children because it's so touchable. And Greg says that lamb's ears are particularly pretty in wreaths that have a lot of pink flowers or placed in a bowl of homemade potpourri. And then he talks about bigger flowers. White lilacs, for instance, can hang dry easily and turn a pearlescent cream color. And then hydrangeas can also be hang dried and then dyed in a variety of shades. And then he gives this tip. Asters, which are a garden classic, dry beautifully in beach sand. Greg says, experimentation teaches you a lot, and I have found an ally in the microwave oven. 
The results, particularly with peonies, daffodils, marigolds, and roses, and Greg says that the special advantage of microwave flower drying is that the delicate natural color of the bloom is preserved because the drying time is a fraction of traditional methods. So there you go. If you have some early daffodils coming out and you want to try to dry one of them, just take a cutting and pop it in the microwave. Set the timer for 30 seconds and then check on it. And if it's not dry enough, you can set it for another 30 seconds and so on. You may have to use your judgment here and you may have to adjust the time a little bit, but you should be able to have a dried daffodil in a matter of minutes. Thanks for listening to The Daily Gardener. And remember, for a happy, healthy life, garden every day. Hey, thanks for spending part of your day with The Daily Gardener. If you want to read even more botanical brevities, just head on over to thedailygardener.org. That's where you can find all the stories, biographies, and books that I share on the show. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for my free Friday newsletter. It has lots of goodies in it, and I try to make the newsletter like you're getting a marvelous letter from a garden friend. You can always find The Daily Gardener on all your favorite social media. You can follow the show on Twitter, and you have a standing invitation to join the free Facebook group for listeners of the show. Just search for Daily Gardener Community the next time you're on Facebook and request to join. Last but not least, you can easily share your gardener greetings or book submissions by emailing me at jennifer at the dailygardener.org. The Daily Gardener is produced in lovely Maple Grove in Wyoming, Minnesota, with the help of Paige Mance, Brooke Beerbaum, and Eric Begay. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling, and as always, have a great day in the garden, and we'll see you tomorrow.